Texas Lutheran University. Welcome to the Biology Seminar today. We're excited to have Dr. Jason Chapman here with us. Um, he comes to us with getting his bachelor's in zoology at the University of Swansea in Wales. His PhD is in entomology, which was from the University of Southampton in England. And he's currently at the Rothamsted Agricultural Research Institute in the London area. So we're excited to have him talk to us today about his research that he's been doing there and, and a little bit about what he's doing here in Texas. And uh, please welcome Dr. Chapman. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first opportunity to visit this, uh, this fine institution. So my name's Jason Chapman. I'm a, a research scientist uh, at uh, an institution called Rothamsted Research. It's um, an agricultural research station just outside of London in, in South East England. And everybody at, at my institute is, is concerned with finding more sustainable ways of growing crops. And my particular interest is in trying to find uh, more environmentally friendly ways of controlling insect pests that destroy agricultural crops. And in particular, I focus on migratory insects. So insects which travel great distances over the course of their lifetime. And those kinds of insect pests are very difficult to control because they can arrive in huge numbers in an area that you weren't expecting them to and, and catch uh, farmers unawares. And so by studying their migration systems, we can hopefully develop ways of predicting and forecasting when and where and how many of these pests will arrive. And that will allow us to develop more efficient and, and better timed control strategies that will enable us to uh, grow crops in a safer and more environmentally friendly way. So I've been at Rothamsted for about 18 years now using a variety of techniques to study insect migration. And in particular, we've, we've developed this unique tool, uh, a kind of radar that allows us to get an eye, uh, to have a, a, a vision of what's happening as these insect migrants fly high above our head. And I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about today in this, this seminar. So um, many of you might not have understood that insects are actually regular and long-range migrants, but there are many species, perhaps you've, you know of the monarch butterfly, but there are many species that migrate uh, long distances. And um, there are some important differences in the way that insects migrate compared to the way that birds migrate, for example. And I'll just quickly run through this background information before I go on to my research. So I'm going to focus on those kind of insects that make migrations which are similar to birds and moving north and south over the seasons. But insect migration differs in some very important aspects. And the first is that insect migration is multi-generational. So what we mean by that is that there are many generations throughout the course of the year. And each generation only carries out one leg of the journey. So they will migrate one part of the journey. Those adults will then stop and lay their eggs and die. And then the offspring of those adults will carry out the next leg of the journey. And so that's rather different from birds, which only breed at one point in their migratory cycle. But the, the benefit of this for the insects is that they breed continuously throughout the year. And that means that population sizes can become enormous because every few months or so they'll have a new generation. And many of these insect migrants can lay huge numbers of eggs. So a single female moth, for example, that we study can lay 2,000 eggs. And if all of those eggs survive to produce uh, the next generation of adults, you can see that very quickly you get massive populations building up. And that's why many of these species are important pests, because they can breed very quickly and occur in, in such huge numbers. Um, another important difference is that because insects, individual adult insects, don't typically live for very long, they can't carry out the kind of long-distance journeys that birds would be able to do using their own powered flight alone. They have to rely on the wind to carry them these great distances. Um, but that's led to the idea that, therefore, the insects are at the mercy of the wind, that they will just be blown randomly in whichever way the wind is blowing. And you can imagine that it would be impossible to carry out these annual cyclical journeys if you were at the mercy of the wind. And so what we have found in our research is that these insects have evolved some really quite surprising and sophisticated ways of using the wind to their advantage, but not uh, let it, letting it blow them in the wrong direction. And that's really going to be the focus of the talk that I will uh, speak about today, how insects use the wind in order to carry out these migrations. 
Okay, so it's a really exciting time to be working in the field of, of animal migration. Um, because of the development of technology that allows us to track animal migrants, we've made some pretty amazing discovery about a wide range of migrants. And I'll just give an example here on birds. So, for example, you can attach satellite tags to the back of individual birds and track their journeys in great detail. We can get very accurate locations where they are basically every minute of the day. And you can, you can have these tags running for years and years, so you can watch long-lived animals carry out repeat multiple journeys. And we've learned some amazing things from this kind of technique. So, for example, um, the bar-tailed godwit, which is a, a, a wader or shorebird, is now being shown to migrate in a single flight from uh, Alaska all the way down to New Zealand, which is basically the longest overseas flight that you could possibly carry out anywhere in the, on the face of the earth. And it takes those birds uh, uh, six to nine days and nights of non-stop flight to cover that 11,000 kilometers. And it's only because we had tags on these birds that we were able to find out that this amazing feat. Now, of course, studying insect migration is very difficult in comparison to studying birds because they're much too small to carry those tags. We haven't been able to develop tags small enough for insects to carry yet. And many of these insect migrants that we wish to study, they migrate at high altitudes. So I'll, I'll talk about this in, in more detail. But we're talking about heights of maybe up to a kilometer above the ground. And so it's impossible for us to observe them at those heights. And many species also migrate at night. So we have to rely on uh, trying to interpret their movements from arrivals on the ground. And, and for many years, that's how people studied insect migration. But what we've done in, in, in my group is, is develop uh, techniques that are allowed us to, to, to study them in, in a different way. Now, it's really important to study insect migration, as I'll try to show, because of the scale of insect migrants. So on this slide here, I'll show, first of all, that I, I did a calculation that showed that about 30 million songbirds like this swallow uh, leave the UK each autumn on their annual migration uh, southwards towards Africa. But a single species of moth that also breeds in the UK and carries out these, the same journey, up to maybe 500 million or half a billion individuals of a single species carry out the same journey. And in, in recent work that I'm, that I'm doing, we've estimated that about a trillion, that's a thousand billion or a million million individual insects are migrating above the UK every summer. And the UK, as you probably know, is a rather small, uh, damp, wet, cool corner of northwestern Europe. It's not a place that has a huge number of insects compared to, for example, here in Texas where warm temperatures allow uh, populations to, uh, of insects to, to become much bigger. And so the numbers involved in insect migration are absolutely huge. As I mentioned, many of those insects are actually very serious pests. Some are spreading diseases. They spread diseases of our crops. They spread diseases of our livestock. And they spread diseases of humans. Other species actually eat the crops directly. And so if the, the, you know, taking these two things into account, the numbers involved and the serious implications of the movements of some of those species, it's really crucial that we do study insect migration. Now, the, the tool that we've been using in, in my group is um, a specialized kind of radar we've developed that amazingly allows us to study the flight behavior of individual insects as they fly hundreds of meters above the ground. Now, we call this tool the vertical looking radar, or, or VLR for short, because it's a tool that basically uh, gives you a spotlight on what's happening directly overhead. And we have several of these uh, radars at, at, um, in the UK, and we're also now developing new systems that we're starting to place in various places around the world, including right here in Seguin. And at the end of my talk, I'll tell you about the work that we're doing, we're doing here. Now, um, I will very quickly and very briefly describe how the system works, but I'm not going to go into, into much technical detail. Basically, what the, the radar does is it sends a, a beam directly upwards. And then as insects fly through that beam at heights from about 150 meters up to 1,200 meters above the ground, Anything that flies through will send a signal back down. And we collect those signals and, and analyze them. And from those signals, we can get a lot of information about those individuals. So firstly, we can separate insects from anything else that passes through the beam. And then for the insects, we can uh, separate them and classify them into different categories because we can get information on their shape and their size and their wing beating frequency. So we can separate, for example, uh, butterflies from dragonflies, moths from beetles, and so on. And we also get information on their shape, sorry, on their speed and direction of movement relative to the ground. 
So as they're traveling overhead, they will be, be in, uh, uh, they will be uh, basically carried by the wind, and we can see the direction that they're moving in. And in addition to that, we can actually tell which way the individual insects are pointing. So we can see their flight heading. So we can see the direction in which they would have been flying if it wasn't for the action of the wind. And having all of those pieces of information together, we can start to understand the migration patterns of particular groups of insects. And now I'm going to uh, focus on studies that I've been carrying out on a particular moth uh, pest species called the silver Y moth or autographa gamma. So um, this, the silver Y moth is a, an important pest species in, in northern Europe. You have very similar moths here in, in Texas um, that are uh, also very important migratory pests. And, and you possibly have heard of some of their names, like the fall armyworm, the corn earworm, and so on, that attack maize. Well, this is a similar species from Europe. And it migrates into northern Europe, places like the UK and Scandinavia, each summer from its winter breeding grounds in the Mediterranean region of, uh, of Europe uh, and North Africa. And sometimes it occurs in very large numbers. So I've shown some here's, years here where we have huge invasions. And in those years, it causes very serious pest problems. And so if we can understand its migration systems and predict when those years are likely to happen, you can imagine that that will help us greatly in terms of controlling the pest. So each year that the moths arrive in, in the late spring, and then they disappear uh, in the late summer, early autumn. And it wasn't known at the, uh, before I started this work whether the moths could actually migrate back to their winter breeding grounds or whether when they disappeared it was just because they died because of the onset of cold and unfavorable weather in the autumn. Um, what we have found is that it migrates at night at high altitudes, as I'll show in a moment. And so we, have, we had some questions. You know. So given that it's flying in these airstreams, which move much faster than it can fly itself, can the moths actually control their movement directions, or are they just randomly and passively distributed by the wind? And is there any evidence that large numbers of these moths return to their winter breeding grounds? So when they invade in huge numbers, do they travel back? So the first thing I had to do was um, get uh, separate radar targets that we believed were uh, produced by this species of moth and, and no other insects. And we did this uh, through a process of elimination. So first of all, we, we selected targets which matched the shape and the size and the wing beating frequency characteristics of this species. And then we selected, obviously, only those that were flying at night. And then I plotted them out here. This is over the course of a, of a single year. The closed circle shows the numbers of these targets detected by our radar throughout the year. And you see we had a peak in spring when the moth first arrives, and then another peak in the late summer, early autumn, when the moths disappeared. And the, the second uh, data set here is the numbers of this particular species of moth caught in our light traps at the ground level. So you can see that those two uh, data sets match very nicely. So that was the first piece of evidence that our radar data was, in fact, that species. So that was for a single year. And then when we looked at the pattern across a 10-year period and just plotted the total numbers per year, you can see that in red, Here's our uh, number of moths detected by the radar. It goes up and down, and it matches perfectly the numbers of uh, this moth caught in our light traps. So we were fairly convinced by this point that our radar data was actually produced by this species of moth. And finally, uh, by carrying out periods of aerial sampling, by attaching a, a net to the bottom of a helium-filled balloon and flying this at great altitude, we were also able to show for, for certain that this moth was highly abundant in these high altitude airstreams and much more abundant than any other species of similar shape and size. So we were by now convinced that our radar data genuinely was uh, to, produced by this species of moth. And so we wanted to know at what heights the moths preferentially flew. So we knew that they went up high, but did they just randomly disperse themselves throughout the, the vertical column or did they concentrate at particular heights? And in fact, we found that they did concentrate at particular altitudes. And this, this figure shows uh, data for a particular day and night. And what we're interested in here is what's happening in the evening. And so here at about sunset, this is uh, 8 p.m. in the evening, there was a big takeoff of insects. So here's altitude. It's 200 meters up to a kilometer above the ground. And we saw these insects taking off and then flying uh, throughout the night till about one o'clock in the morning in this layer which was about 600 meters above the ground on this particular night. So those moths were climbing up and getting into this layer and we wanted to know why were they at that particular altitude and, and not above and below. 
And when we looked at many nights, we found that this moth was nearly always found in these layers, and it was typically around about this kind of height above the ground. But night to night, the layers varied. And then when we plotted these heights of these layers against uh, meteorological information, we found that they always uh, concentrated in the zone where the wind speeds were fastest. So the moths were getting into the fastest moving jets so they could get the maximum amount of wind assistance and travel at great speeds. And they were traveling very fast. So on average, they were traveling at 50 kilometers an hour, which is about 35 miles per hour. That was on average. Our, our fastest moths we found were traveling up to 100 kilometers an hour or about 70 miles an hour. So they could really get a huge amount of assistance and travel a great distance in a very short amount of time. So these moths here fly in for three or four hours at, at 50 kilometers an hour. You can see they can very quickly cover huge distances in just a single night's flight. But of course, that would only be beneficial traveling so fast if you were traveling in a direction which was favorable. So in the spring, you'd want to go north. And in the south, you'd want to go, sorry, in the autumn, you'd want to go south. Um, and so were the moths able to have any control over that? Or were they traveling in all kinds of random directions? And what we found was that they did have, they were showing uh, a, a large amount, a large degree of control over their migration directions. So the, these plots are called circular histograms. And each of the small circles on the outside is the migration direction on a particular night for, of these silver Y moths. And I split them up here into the spring and the autumn. And so this is north and this is south. And so you can see that in the spring, all of the migration nights, with a few exceptions, were on nights when the winds would have taken the moth from the south to the north. And in the autumn, there was a complete reversal. So the moths all flew on nights when the winds took them from the north to the south. So they were showing very high level of selectivity for favorable tailwinds. But remember, these tailwinds were at 600 meters or 800 meters above the ground. So the moth wasn't able to assess that from the ground level. They must have climbed up to that altitude and sampled the wind and decided whether it was a good night for migration or not. And if it wasn't, they would have come back down. And this pattern is not explained just by prevailing wind directions because when I plotted the wind directions on every night here, not just the migration nights, but every night, you can see it's a completely random distribution. We have winds in the UK in this season from the north, from the so uh, south, from the east, from the west. But the moths only selected those nights which would have taken them in the favorable direction. And they're not only selected winds. You remember that I told you the radar can also detect which direction the moth was pointing, which direction it was trying to fly. And you can see the moths also preferentially flew in the correct direction. So they were not only finding favorable winds and finding the fastest winds, but then flying in the correct direction to add their own self-powered flight speed. And so they were actually traveling even faster than those winds. So I said the winds were on average at 50 kilometers an hour. The moths were traveling about 60 kilometers an hour because they were traveling with the wind and adding their own speed to it. So it's an incredibly efficient system. And what they're able to do is select you know, the fastest and the most favorably directed winds. And this will allow them to travel in up to about 300 kilometers in a single night. So what I was interested in doing now was, was trying to understand how those behaviors we observed at these points where our radars were measuring them, how that actually translated into the migration trajectory of those moths over the course of a single night. And so just to help you with the geography, this here is the, the south coast of England, and this is the north coast of France. And this here is the, 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 the English Channel between England and France. And these point locations here are where our, our radars are. And what we've done is we've done some meteorological trajectory simulations. We basically have modeled the movement of a parcel of air um, released from our radar site at uh, sunset when the moths take off and see how far they would travel by sunrise the following, uh, sorry, I said that. No, that's right, the sunrise the following morning, yeah. So how far they would have traveled over the course of a single night. And these two panels here are for nights during the autumn when silver Y moths were flying, but they just show what passive particles in the air would have done. So if a particle of pollution with no flight behavior had traveled downwind, this is what would have happened. So these ones wouldn't have uh, reached uh, the coast of England. But here's what happens with the moths on that particular night. When you add the flight behavior of the moth into the model, you can see that they've traveled much further and safely crossed the English Channel and reached France by the following morning. 
And on average, the flight behavior of those individuals can change the, uh, both the, the distance and the direction of these trajectories by quite a significant amount. And by carrying out lots of these comparisons, we found that the flight behavior of the insect added a 50% increase to the distance that could be traveled. So the average distance they could travel in a single night was 300 kilometers. So this is pretty amazing. You know, we're talking about an insect whose body is this long, you know, of a centimeter or a centimeter and a half long. And it can travel 300 kilometers in a single night by selecting favorable tailwinds. So when you scale the, you know, that distance to the size of the animal, we're talking about a, a, an incredibly uh, long migration direction in just a single night. Now those moths can actually migrate for several nights in a row. So you can very quickly see how the over, even within their very short lifespans, they only live for a couple of weeks, you can see how these moths are able to travel from Northern Europe to Southern Europe in the course of a, of a single generation. <clears throat> so, so far I've, I've talked about my research on, on insects solely from the perspective of insects, but many people who are working in migration study birds, and we decided it would be very interesting to see how our, our data compared to migration patterns of uh, songbirds, uh, which are also carrying out similar kinds of journeys at the same time of year. And I was very fortunate to find out that while for the 10-year period that we were doing radar studies in southern England, some uh, colleagues of mine who work in Sweden were carrying out radar studies of bird migration in southern Sweden over exactly the same time period. And we had hugely equivalent data sets. And we thought, well, it'd be really interesting to pull those data sets together and see how the birds and the moths are both trying to solve this problem of migrating uh, long distances in a short amount of time as possible and in the, the safest uh, and most efficient manner that they can. And we found there were some interesting differences between the flight patterns of birds and moths. So, for example, here's the flight altitude above the ground, and here's the proportion of individuals that are at each height. And we found that, on average, songbirds fly higher in the sky than, than the moths. So our moths were typically around about five, 600 meters above the ground, half a kilometer or so, whereas the songbirds were flying at more like one to two kilometers above the ground. Now, our moths, you remember, were selecting the fastest moving winds. So this means that the birds are not selecting the fastest winds. They've gone higher for some reason. We're not quite sure yet why they've gone higher, but they're not in the fastest winds. And you'll see that that's actually quite significant. The moth data you've already seen, so this is just repeating this, but now I've plotted on the same plots the directional data of the songbirds as well. And what you can see is that they have very similar patterns. So here are the migration directions. We have the moths in red and the songbirds in blue. This time the autumn's on top and spring on the bottom. But you can see that in both seasons, the, song, the songbirds and the moths have very similar distributions. And so the moths are able to match the directional control of the songbirds. Now the songbirds are much bigger, they can fly much faster. So this was a great surprise. We assumed that birds would have much greater control over their migration direction than these tiny insects. But that's not the case. The birds and the songbirds have very similar distributions both in their migratory directions and in their flight headings. What the difference was is when you look at the downwind directions on the nights when these groups were flying, you can see that while the moths are concentrated, they only fly on these nights with favorable winds, songbirds fly on nights with winds from all possible directions. So they do not show this tailwind selectivity that the insects do. They just fly every night. Now they can do that because they're powerful enough to fly through crosswinds and headwinds, and the insects can't achieve that, of course. The insects have to have favorable winds, but the songbirds are able to power through unfavorable winds. But that has big consequences for them because, of course, they're not getting the tailwind assistance. They're not um, being assisted on the journey. They're having to battle through unfavorable winds very often. And that's why they fly higher, because the winds are slower. So they don't want to get into the fastest winds because the fastest winds are often blowing in the wrong direction. And so that's one of the reasons we believe that they fly at different altitudes. But the really surprising result of all of, of all of those studies was that our moths, although being much smaller and much slower flying, actually travel faster than the songbirds. So this diagram here shows in blue the typical speed relative to the ground during both the spring and, and the autumn. And then in red we have the moth speeds. And the averages here you can see for the, the moths in both cases, are faster than the birds. And so 
the, even though the moth can only fly at about one third or one quarter of the speed of the songbirds, if they didn't have wind assistance, they actually travel faster than them in a, in a back, single bout of migration. So their average speed is about 15 meters per second, or about uh, 50 kilometers an hour, as we discussed earlier on. And they can travel really great distances in, in, the, in the short amount of time that they have available to them. Now, the disadvantage, of course, is that they have to wait for nights with favorable winds. And so if favorable winds don't come along, the moths are basically in trouble. They can't manage those migrations. So the advantage that the songbirds have is that they have greater flexibility. They can migrate on many more nights. But you can see that these groups have evolved different strategies of coping with the same issue of getting from A to B as quickly as they possibly can. But the upshot of this research was that, you know, the really uh, fascinating result was that, uh, you know, an organism which is only one hundredth of the weight of the birds that feed on them, they're able, able to carry out the same kind of journeys and travel faster than the birds by very efficient uh, use of wind currents in order to help them, them travel. So why, why do insects migrate, though? I mean, we've shown how they can do it. And we've shown that they've evolved very efficient strategies to do it, as efficient as they can. But you can imagine these journeys are still costly. They're still risky. There's a high risk of mortality. What if you end up flying into the sea or the desert somewhere that you're not going to be able to breed? So we were interested in why the insects migrate. And so, again, looking at the, uh, this study species, the silver wire moth, we were able to estimate how many individual moths arrive in the UK from our, because we have these radars distributed throughout the country. And you remember that it has this cyclical population pattern. So we split the data into the big invasion years, these ones here, and the non-invasion years, these much smaller ones. And you can see that during the invasion years, that up to about a quarter of a billion uh, moths would arrive in the UK each year. So we're talking about huge invasions. But interestingly, in the autumn, an even greater number would leave the UK. And so rather than being somewhere where these moths arrive and never leave, in fact, we're a producer of moths. We send more back. We're an exporter of moths, if you like. Um, and we send them back to the winter breeding grounds in, in greater numbers than they arrived. And this is actually much more apparent in the smaller years. I mean, we, we only have, you know, 25 million or so arriving. But on average, about 100 million returns. So there's a fourfold increase and so one of the benefits of migration, we think, for these insects is that by timing their arrival in, in the northern latitude uh, spring perfectly, they arrive when there's this fresh flush of vegetation, there's not many predators and parasites to attack them. They can breed, come in, breed really quickly, grow up a population, and then move before the conditions deteriorate. And if they move to a, a, the next place where it's also suitable to breed, you can see that these populations can very quickly build up. Now, of course, there must be a point where the population crashes, because otherwise they would increase and increase and increase forever. But what we found is that it's the winter breeding grounds down in the Mediterranean, which are the bottleneck. That's where the populations crash. And that's turned this old idea on its head that moths expanded from these southern regions, went into northern regions, and then uh, basically died and didn't return. In fact, it's the northern regions which are the driver of the population dynamics. So it's really important for us to understand this when we're trying to build predictive models um, for, for pest control. I'll skip that. <clears throat> so what I've talked about so far has been the work I've done in the UK and in, and in Europe over the last 15 years or so. Um, and we've really established a very good understanding of moth and other insect migration patterns in, in my corner of the world. What we're interested in doing now is trying to understand insect patterns in other regions. And so it's, it's with great excitement that in the last year we've placed one of my uh, vertical looking radars here, uh, right here in, in Seguin, just outside town, because we're very interested in the migration patterns of some of the most important pest moths, which are here in, in, in Texas, in species which move up from Mexico, travel through Texas, and then establish themselves throughout the whole of the uh, USA, and then travel back down again in the autumn. And so a whole team of us uh, have uh, become involved in this project. So we have uh, people from my lab who are interested in the, the pest insect migration. And then we have uh, John, who works for the USDA, who's here in the audience, who's a, a meteorologist who's trying to understand the influence of climate and, and weather patterns on these insect uh, migrations. 
And we're also collaborating with scientists like Jennifer here who study bats because, as you will see, the bats are also potentially a really important part of this system. They may be providing very good biological control by eating the migrant moths before they've had a chance to come in and lay eggs on your crops. And we're going to study a whole bunch of different species here, hopefully, but this is just one of the species that, that we're interested in. You may have heard of it. It's called the fall armyworm. It's a very important pest of, of maize or, or corn. And it's a species that, in, in terms of the system that we're interested in, spends the winter down here in the kind of Rio Grande Valley, te Texas-Mexican border. And then in the spring, around about this time actually now, it will start migrating northwards. It will come up into the, the Great Plains and the Midwest and attack the, in, in, in the Corn Belt before making a return journey back south in the autumn. And just like the species I study, it comes through in variable numbers. You can never predict in advance how many you're going to get or exactly when they're going to arrive or exactly where they're going to arrive. And so by studying their migration system, we can hopefully, again, provide information to uh, extension workers and crop growers about when and where control strategies should be applied. And I also mentioned... Uh, the, the role that these bats may be playing. So again, you may well know that uh, this part of Texas has huge accumulations of, of uh, Brazilian free-tailed bats or Mexican free-tailed bats. In fact, the largest accumulations of mammals anywhere in the world occur in caves here in Texas and New Mexico and, and so on, where we have anywhere up to about 20 million of these bats come in, and they actually feed on these moths while they're undergoing these migrations. The bats forage at heights up to about a kilometre above the ground where the moths are flying. And we're trying to understand this whole system, what effect that the uh, bats have on the moths. So if the bats weren't here, would there be even worse uh, pest problems in the crops? Or do, in fact, the bats play a very minor role and don't take many of the, of the pests? Because, you know, obviously these moths occur in such huge numbers that uh, there's still plenty of them left after the bats have fed on them. So we're, we're, we're doing a number of different uh, techniques here at uh, Inseguin to try and understand this system. We've installed a radar to tell us about what the insects are doing at altitude. But I thought you might uh, be interested in, in this bit of footage which shows how we actually sample the aerial fauna. How do we prove that the insects we believe our radar is detecting is actually up there? And you can see that what we do is we, we have these helium-filled uh, balloons or, or uh, helikite. And we attach a, a net here, it's like a windsock underneath. And then we allow this uh, on a tether line to go up to maybe 200, 300 meters above the ground. Now, this is a test run du done during the day, but of course, when we're doing our field work for, for genuine, we, we fly them at night. And then we, we fly throughout the night, and we can haul the net back down and see which species we caught. And that will help us interpret the, the radar data. And this is a really you know, interesting uh, a way to, to sample the fauna. And we, we sit there all night and we run light traps and we look at the fauna on the ground and we look at the fauna in the air. And uh, it's you know, a really nice system and uh, we works very well normally. Last night we had a bit of a problem. Our uh, tether line snapped in very strong winds and we've lost one of our balloons, unfortunately, with the net attached. Um, so if any of you find a large white balloon <laughs> with a net attached to it uh, any time in the next few weeks, and please, please do let us know. Fortunately, we have two, two nets and two balloons, so we can still continue the work. We're also carrying out trapping at ground level as well, which is a very, a very important part of the work. And so I'm not going to talk about this for very long, but you can see that what we did here last, last autumn was we selected data from our radar for the kind of moths that the fall armyworm looks like. And we see, you know, there's different numbers of them flying every night. But, you know, which ones are fall armyworms? Which ones are corn earworms? It's very difficult to tell. The radar can't distinguish moths, which are so similar. But I, I've just put a red arrow here on this particular night, which was the 26th of October last year, because 
We were pheromone trapping for fall armyworms at ground level. We're pheromone trapping for lots of different moths. Pheromones, species-specific signals that only attract the males of that particular species and don't attract anything else in. And for the fall armyworm, we can see that we were catching nothing, 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 nothing. And then suddenly on the 26th, you know, we got 40 moths on average per trap. So there'd obviously been a sudden arrival of these moths. And so this, this data here is presumably, therefore, fall armyworms that were migrating through the region. And so we can look at those data and find out what they were doing. And here's the, the directions of migration of those individuals in, in that peak. And you can see that they are flying in a kind of southwesterly direction. So if you go back to that uh, map of where fall armyworms go in the spring, you can imagine that this would be a good migratory direction to be coming back. So the question we were interested in was, why on the 26th? You know, what was, what was so different about the 26th, what had happened uh, in the previous days? And so what we've plotted here, I hope you can make this out. Here's a you know, map of Mexico, and here's, here's the radar site in Seguin in Texas. Here are the Great Lakes to give you uh, scale. And this shows wind directions at the heights that these moths typically fly. And so you can see that, um, and the colors show, the, the, the brighter, warmer colors show the fastest winds. And so you can see that on the 24th, the winds were blowing this way. So moths couldn't have come here, down here. That's why we saw no fall armyworms. Suddenly on the 25th, I mean, all our fall armyworms are up here. And on the night of the 25th, the winds start going this way. So you can imagine they're starting to travel down. And by the night of the 26th, we have very fast, favorably directed winds right over Seguin. And so the moths have traveled down from the Great Plains on these suitable winds uh, over the course of a few nights. And that explains why they suddenly arrived in this area. And so here we have now a, a system where we can look at the wind patterns and temperature patterns and wind speed and strength patterns and figure out, well, this is obviously, you know, when we should expect fall armyworms. So even if we didn't have a radar or a pheromone trap telling us something about when the moths arrived, we can probably use these kind of maps to help us predict when those pest moths will suddenly arrive in, in an area. Um, now, we were there to... We were there to track these pest moths. Um, and while we were sitting around at our light traps and pheromone traps at night, eating tortilla chips as you do, we were infested by crickets, as I'm sure you remember in the autumn. They were just everywhere, these ground crickets, right? Now, I'm sure you, like, like us, you think these things just hop around on the ground and do nothing else. And we were absolutely flabbergasted that when we hauled down our net uh, on the first night of sampling I was there, that at the net at 300 meters above the ground had several of these, oops, sorry, several of these ground crickets uh, in the net. And then on the next night, we had lots of crickets. And on the next night, we had lots of crickets. And it turns out that these are the most abundant species flying 200 meters above the ground. Now, most of these crickets are flightless. They don't have wings. But you can see, that actually, you might just be able to make out these are the long wings of this particular individual. So a few individuals in a population have very long wings, and most are flightless. But these long-winged ones are obviously, have wings for a reason. And the reason is for dispersal, long-range dispersal. So, you know, we've made a, quite an interesting discovery here that was totally unexpected, that these crickets are actually a very important part of the aerial fauna. And if you go back here, you know, in terms of, well, there are not moths flying every night, right? So what are the bats eating? And what we found out, um, what uh, our colleague Jennifer has found out, and she's done this in a, a rather interesting way, she's looked at the DNA in the uh, bat feces to find out what they've been eating. And she was amazed to find that this cricket was actually making up a major component of their diet. Now, she, like everybody else, thought the crickets were on the ground. So she thought, well, when the moths weren't up there, the bats must be coming down and taking the crickets off the ground. But we've now explained this mystery. When the crickets, when the moths are not flying and the crickets are flying, then the, that's what the bats uh, preferentially feed on. So by carrying out this kind of work and sitting in the field at night, you get a good idea, you know, you get a you get new ideas and you make new discoveries. And so it's, it's, always, it's always an exciting thing to do. So just coming to the end of the talk now, and I'd like to thank you all for listening. And I hope I've managed to convince you today, probably many of you had never thought about insects at all before today, um, convince you that actually they're very interesting organisms and worthy of study. And that insect migration is actually a very important but undervalued component of our ecosystems. Now, I've focused on the crop pests today. There are lots of insects which are beneficial, which carry out migrations as well. And so they, they all, all of these movements have huge impacts on our ecosystems. And if we don't study them, we can't truly understand how ecosystems function without knowing about this flux 
in and out that happens on a seasonal basis. And we've seen that many of these insects have really quite complicated and sophisticated migration strategies. Um, they're able to use winds very efficiently. So they're not at the mercy of the wind. In fact, they use winds to their own benefit uh, exceptionally well. So I just want to thank lots and lots of colleagues, in particular my, my colleagues from, from Rothamsted, Phil and Jason, who have helped me set up the work here in, in Texas. And in particular, I'd like to thank John, who's uh, enabled all of the work here to, to happen in, in Texas. And this is also just a reminder of what the balloon looks like, in case you see it. <laughs> please, please, show, please report to John if you do see it. And finally, I'll just leave you with some pictures from our field work at the site, which is just down the road from you, you here. So if any of you are driving around at sunset, you might see our one remaining balloon flying in the sky with things attached to it, so you'll now know what we're doing. You might see some bright lights glowing in the field. That's our light traps. And there's a, a representative of some of the amazing insects that we tracked into the lights that keep us occupied while we're sitting there all through the night. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time. And <laughs> take any questions. <clears throat> Question. Yeah. Very, very nice talk. Uh, this is very, this is very elegant research. Uh, can you uh, speak to the bioenergetics of these moths? Uh, do they have uh, actin, myosin? Do they make ATP? How do they actually drive the energy for locomotion? Yeah. So um, I, I can say a little bit about that. Although I'm, I'm not a, a physiologist, I don't. I don't fully understand all the molecular pathways, but so the, there are several interesting things here. First of all, the fuel that they use is lipid, but the moths don't eat lipid as adults. They only feed on nectar, which provides short-term uh, energetic uh, uh, input into, fr from sugars. So all of the fuel that they get uh, occurs when they're a caterpillar. So that they partition the different components of their life. So when they're caterpillars, they do nothing but eat, and they pile on weight and they grow very quickly and they store all the fuel that they need in their, for their migratory flights. And then when they emerge as adults, they uh, initially are they're sexually immature. They're not capable of, of producing eggs or mating. And that's when they migrate. And it's only when they finish the migration that they then use what remaining fuel that they have uh, to, for egg production in the female. So they have to kind of trade off you know, th this balance between how much fuel you use for migration and how much fuel you use for, um, uh, for egg, egg, egg development. I, I can't answer your specific question about ATP and my, it's, that's not my no, area, but, but um, that's very yeah. That's interesting, I, I did not know that. Uh, hummingbirds is a big uh, research interest in the group in Texas. Mm -hmm. And there are all the birds uh, discovered what's, what's been called the, the stop gene. What tells a hummingbird how much to feed? Right. To stop eating. Uh huh. To have enough fuel and to be the lift to ratio to go to the music stand and come back. Yes. Yeah. That stop gene is important, and that's going to be a Nobel Prize. People think on how humans stop eating is obese. Oh, really? Yes. So yeah. They, they yeah. Obviously, have a stop gene too, as as a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. They have enough food to stop. Yes. Yes. And, and in these species also, they're, they're very flexible. They can either race through as caterpillars and produce small adults, which are not very good migrants, or they can take longer to develop and produce bigger adults, which lay more eggs and can migrate further. But the, the advantage of, of developing quicker is that you're less likely to be eaten. Right. And so, again, that's a trade-off. And you have some individuals which are fast and small and some individuals which are slow. And, and, that, and as you say, this will all be controlled by, by the genes, and one day we'll figure out you know what those genes are. Very interesting, yeah. very good work. Thank you. I was wondering yeah. if you could share with the students some of what we talked about at lunch about the compass yeah, or the center. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. Like in birds versus insects, what, what's kind of known about how they know where to migrate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a fascinating topic, which I didn't get into for, for time constraints today. But, you know, how the insects are able to, uh, well, how, how all migratory animals are able to uh, De decide in which direction to fly and which nights have suitable winds and so on. So it's, it's much, been much better studied in birds. Um, songbirds are known to have uh, a magnetic compass and amazingly they actually see the Earth's magnetic field. The compass is in the eye. Uh, they have a star compass so um, they can uh, determine their direction by looking at the constellations of star patterns and figuring out which way is north and south. They have a sun compass so if they fly during the day or during sunset and sunrise, 
They can uh, determine north and south from the position of the sun. And they can actually calibrate all of these compasses against each other. So it, if they have all three cues, they're very, very good. And if they only have one of those cues, they can still make it. Uh, but if they can expose to a second cue for a short amount of time, they can recalibrate their first cue if they've sort of drifted off. So, so they have a, a way of integrating information from all of those different systems. Now, for these night flying insects, none of this has been determined. So we don't know which of those compass mechanisms they, they have. But we suspect that they don't have the, um, the sensory capacity to use star patterns like the, like the birds do, because their vision isn't as good. Uh, but we suspect that they probably will have a magnetic compass. The day flying uh, insects, like the monarch butterfly, that has a sun compass. That's been well established. And it can tell north and south from the position of the sun. And to do that, you also have to have a very accurate clock because you need to know exactly what time of day it is because, of course, the sun is constantly moving across the sky. And so to determine which way is north, you fly at a particular angle from the sun. But, you know, minute by minute, that angle changes. And so you have to have a very accurate clock. And this is also being discovered. This is fascinating. The clock of the butterfly is not in its brain or in its eye. It's in the tip of the antennae, you know, these feelers that come out. And they can actually see in inverted commas in that they can sense the sunlight and tell uh, what time of day it is from, from that, from the light intensity. And if you paint black paint over the tip of the antennae of the monarch butterfly, it loses its ability to migrate by the sun, even though it can still see the sun with its eyes because it's lost its clock, which is in the antennae. So it's a really fascinating system. And it, it's, I mean, the, the, the more general point is that as humans, you know, we're, we're, um, we're, the way we see the world is determined by our sensory capabilities. And migratory animals have a whole range of different sensory capabilities, which are totally different to ours. And so it's very difficult for us to understand how they see the world. I mean, I have no idea what the Earth's magnetic field looks like, but, you know, a songbird does, um, which is pretty amazing. Tell how far the silver wine moth is able to travel throughout 300 yes. kilometers, you said, in a night. Yes. What's the di distance between the northern part of the range and the southern part of the range? Can one individual make it uh, uh, while it's an adult? Yes, you can. So, the well, the distance between breeding locations is about a thousand kilometers. So, in, in three or four nights of migration, a single individual can, can do that. Um, it's possible that. Um, they, they don't always do that. They might stop and have generations along the way. But probably some of the, we were just talking about, you know, the, some of the ones which are the best flyers, have the most fuel, they can probably do it in a single journey. And obviously there will be benefits for that because, you know, if you get to the, that region uh, earliest, you, you know, escape the predators and parasites and so on. So there's, there, there, there would be benefits to that. So some individuals can do the whole journey, yes. Are you looking for information on the fall army park in the same way to see about how far it can yeah, well, that's something that, you know, in collaboration with, with John sitting next to you, that's the, the kind of thing we would love to do, not just for the fall worm, but also for the, the corn earworm, another very important pest species. Um, but, uh, you know, here, here I feel like, you know, I'm just kind of scratching the surface of what's going on. There's, you know, I, all of that stuff on the, on, on, the, on the screen here is doing interesting things, and I, I don't know anything about them yet. So uh, I think there's, you know, huge amounts of, uh, there's huge room to, to do interesting studies here. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.